We're going to talk about a few things. I'd like to start with the city, the city of Hamilton, which is um, so abuzz right now in terms of activity and energy. One of the things that we all know as people in this community, but those who are watching may not, is that Hamilton is a city with a remarkable industrial and technological heritage and legacy. And although it's experienced its economic ebbs and flows and activity, the value differentiating proposition for the region to the world um, as uh, an area with incredible assets is very compelling. So as Hamilton's chief global salesman, describe for us, if you can, those assets and advantages that uh, you feel strongly should attract investment here. Well, thank you. And, you know, we, uh, we kind of talk about that often in terms of location, location, location. But when you, when you talk about location, it's just not, uh, you know, what, uh, where, where, you're, where, where you're positioned, but what, what kind of integrates you into the, kind of the major markets that we're going to have to deal with. And so, on, you know, on, on the, uh, the Buffalo side border, uh, and then we uh, look to the Detroit side and the American, uh, you know, volume of population, uh, we're, we're kind of right smack in the middle of that. And, most of the train and transportation corridors come right through the center of Hamilton. Uh, we have, uh, you know, and maintain an active, uh, probably the largest uh, seaport uh, or, or lake port in the, uh, in the province of Ontario, and if not in the country. And uh, the largest cargo port in, in the country for sure. And so when you look at all of that assets, including the, the natural environment assets, so the escarpment that runs through the middle of our city, we have, you know, unusually a two-tiered city. Not unlike Pittsburgh in some, some respects, the comparisons are often made. Uh, we have that, uh, that cultural uh, environmental capacity that uh, you know, lends itself to being quickly uh, into some green space that is very attractive to people that live here. And so uh, when you add all of that up, uh, we're, we're now in a, a position where we see ourselves as the next wave of opportunity for future development and growth uh, in the greater Toronto Hamilton area. And that's starting to happen uh, already. And I would say it's starting. Uh, we're not at the end of it. We're at the beginning of it. And uh, it, we, uh, we can really see the, uh, you know, the, the new cranes coming in and you know, <laughs> building some new residential. We see growth, particularly in the commercial industrial side, which is particularly important for future employment. And we're really trading on all of those uh, assets that, uh, that lead to you know, good transportation networks, good public transit on its way. Uh, all of the elements you need to have a vibrant, active, uh, integrated, and, and uh, sustainable city. From the perspective of economic development looking forward, what is or do you see uh, to be specific focuses of the next five to ten years within this region and either in terms of sectors or industries that are particularly of concern to you? So one of the ones that we don't want to, uh, you know, ignore and, and move away from is uh, manufacturing. But uh, the manufacturing of the future is advanced manufacturing. It's, it's marrying the digital capacities, the technology out there with manufacturing as it is today. So we were successful in being part of the $950 million federal uh, funding envelope that would advance, advance manufacturing locally. And the office happens to be at Innovation Park. Uh, so that, that is a very important sector. It doesn't mean, uh, you know, the, uh, the industry of old. It means uh, in new, advanced, clean uh, manufacturing, uh, you know, uh, production that uh, can be utilized right here on, you know, uh, uh, lands that we already have that uh, need to be repurposed. So all of that former industrial lands at the harbor front uh, is, uh, is zoned accordingly and uh, new clean technology that employs people is going to be part of the future growth. We're heavily involved in uh, the agri-food business. Uh, as you know, we're 75% you know, agricultural here and uh, you know, food production to be uh, used here but exp exported around the right. world is very, very large and they take full advantage of our port capacity and even our, our airport. Uh, they, they, uh, they need those facilities to, uh, to make sure they can move their product uh, where it needs to go. And so we have a great uh, you know, network developed for agribusiness that uh, not only stores and, and transports uh, at the port, but uh, the production itself is actually quite efficiently done and, and, and managed. And then there is uh, the whole technology side. And you know, I would say that uh, you know, we, we've not yet fully developed. The, the potential of technology, and you know, one of the one of the benefits of that is that it, it does lend to 
uh, future efficiencies and uh, the kinds of things that people would like to see improve. So how, how quicker can I use an app to uh, you know, get my city services or what kind of uh, new technology is coming down the pipe like uh, you know, uh, automated vehicles and, are, and do we have test tracks, which we do. Are we participating in that, uh, that development? Uh, the worry on that side of the equation is, uh, you know, how, mu how many people does it unemploy into the future and where does the next iteration of job come from? And so there's a, there's a space there that we have not yet figured out that uh, technology is going to actually uh, challenge us with in terms of future employment because technology, unfortunately, we all love technology, but it does tend to unemploy people or, or, or reduce the employment need. And therefore, what, what is the next iteration of employment that's going to keep people uh, sustainable in our own community? Something we spend a lot of time thinking about. Don't have an answer to it yet, but uh, I think in, over time it'll probably uh, awaken. Let's switch gears a little bit. I wanted to talk about and explore with you the subject of, of leadership. You're obviously um, the leader of, of this municipality. And the question of, of developing and cultivating leadership skills is something important to either aspirational or current business leaders everywhere. Mm -hmm. um, we live, uh, as I think you can appreciate maybe more than most, in an unusually challenging environment with enormous demands on people's time and attention, uh, and, and not the least of which is navigating a culture right now which can be quite polarizing and caustic. Um, what was once talked about uh, as you know, having a thick skin now involves conversations around mental health yeah. uh, and resilience. And this is nowhere more true, obviously, than politics. Um, but in, in terms of your managing and dealing with questions of res resilience and navigating the stresses of leading an organization, how do you maintain equilibrium and optimism in doing that? Well, I mean, there's two sides to that equation. I mean, on a personal level, uh, you know, if you, uh, if you get into politics or leadership and you don't know who you are and you don't have a kind of a solid grounding in terms of uh, what, your, what your purpose is and what you're hoping to achieve, then, you know, it, things can get, get away from you fairly quickly. So I'm pretty grounded in that sense. Uh, you know, it, uh, certainly experience helps. Uh, you know, I've been, I've been around this uh, space for a while. And so uh, you kind of get a sense of, uh, you know, what works and what doesn't work. But, you know, you're right. I mean, it's a, it's a much more transparent uh, process that we operate under. Everybody's got eyes on and uh, you, uh, you are required to, and I think rightfully so, be pretty clear about what you're trying to achieve and, and how you're trying to achieve it. On the, on the city side, uh, you know, having a, having a great team, hiring the right people, uh, empowering them to do their work and I think that's one of the kind of the political challenges because there's always this debate that goes on around who's, who's actually in charge uh, you know are the politicians doing the work or is it the uh, is it the, the team the 8,000 people that, uh, that, that work uh, for the city of Hamilton and empowering the, the leadership in the community to actually take hold of what they can do and giving them the support necessary to do that. Can I just interrupt you there when you talk yeah. about in empowering those within this organization how do you do that as a leader of the organization? Pretty much by staying out of the way unless there's a problem. Uh, you know, they, you know we, can, we can interfere and uh, you know, micromanage these processes and there's always a tendency for politicians to do that. I think we've developed a culture in Hamilton that, uh, and I, I think that's developing in most places as well, that, uh, that we, uh, you know, we set the governance structure uh, and we stay out of the operational. And uh, it, if we start to interfere in the operational is when things go wrong. And so uh, let's make sure there's a pretty clear divide that uh, on the governance side, we set policy, the framework, and you folks deliver. And, uh, you know, we, we count on you because we've hired uh, talented people to, uh, to do this work, and we're going to give you the support you need to actually deliver. If we don't do that, then uh, we're, we're, not, we're not only harming the, uh, the organization, uh, but, uh, but the city as a whole. So I, I see empowerment as a key feature of letting people that you hire Ones that have the skills and the talent, because that's why you hire them, let them go and do the work they need to do. You, in leading, obviously, are the mayor, the only elected official with responsibility and stewardship over the entire community. You've mm -hmm. got 16 councillors who, um, in many respects, might be seen as mayors of their particular constituencies. Right. But you're, you know, you're obliged to have a perspective uh, and think of the community as a whole. And so making decisions that serve the community as a whole requires 
uh, the ability to create consensus and alliances if you're going to be successful. And of course, doing that is a skill, it's a discipline. Um, that doesn't happen by accident and I think is relevant to anyone, whether you're in politics or business. Um, so what's your approach to securing consensus and building alliances? How do you approach doing that? Well, let, let me turn that on its ear a little bit because uh, politics by nature is not a consensus building process. It's, uh, it, is, it is set up for debate and discussion and uh, you know, getting consensus uh, is, uh, you know, on, on all issues is very difficult to achieve. Now, to, to put that into context, most of the routine decisions that we make, and they, they would be routine uh, in decisions around, you know, where does the road go, where does the sidewalk, and when does the side, sidewalk get rebuilt, they tend to be, uh, you know, 90% 90, 90 uh, no issue at all, and you could call that consensus. But when it comes to the bigger issues, uh, there is robust debate, and hardly ever do we come out with 100% uh, unanimity on a, on a course of action that we take. So it is really, uh, you know, governing by majority on those major issues. So there's really two streams to this. There's, uh, you know, the routine, routine work that has to happen. I think there is, uh, you know, hardly ever, you know, argument against that. And I think the consensus building on that space happens long before you make a decision. So are we, are we, you know, have we got a strategic plan uh, sorted out? Uh, have we all agreed to the strategic plan? Is, is it been, has it been indoctrinated throughout the organization? Uh, so they're, they're all clear about where we're going and how we're going to get there. Do we have a, you know, a zoning and planning map mapped out that, uh, that tells us where things are going to go and when? And so if you, if you have all of that in place, then you've, you've, you've built in some already built in consensus on those kinds of routine issues. Major issues, where does the arena go? Is it the mountain or is it the lower city? Or, you know, where, does, where should the stadium be? Those are, those are great, great debates that hardly ever end up on consensus and can get quite complicated because there's different imperatives for different councillors that, uh, that are at the table. And so uh, my strategy is uh, lead by example. Don't, don't, uh, you know, don't sweat the small stuff. Uh, you know, we've got a lot of good people working on those issues. Let's have the, uh, the, the great debates on those issues, but do it in a way that uh, we're not personalizing these issues, we're not uh, attacking one another, we're not pitting one area against another, which used to happen much more frequently than it does today because we're not much more integrated as a community. And, uh, you know, are we then all going to, uh, at the end of the day, support the decision that, uh, that happens? And, you know, invariably nine times out of ten, if, if not more, that's exactly how it plays out. So much, I think, that, that, that is embedded in that conversation has to do with how, whether it's somebody in your position or others in, in any kind of senior position, can cultivate trust, mm. uh, which is a huge determinant of the, the health and success of a variety of relationships. Do, do you think about that? How do you approach that in terms of cultivating relationships in the community and, and being true to your word? How do you manage that? Well, I mean, building relationships is, is kind of the, the nature of the beast, no matter what you do. So, you know, for us, uh, you know, as we, as we look for new opportunities or we're looking at, uh, you know, major projects that we're working on, partners that we're playing with, uh, having, a, having direct relationships with individuals is still how it works. There's no other way to kind of work right. through those issues. So you mean I know, no, you're I not know, using an app for that is what you're saying. Yes, right? Right. yeah, right. I know Lou and Lou knows me and uh, we kind of know what we're about and uh, you know, and you build that level of trust, not because it's given at the outset, but because it's earned over, over a period of time. And so uh, those relationships matter a lot in terms of how work gets done because it, it can go off the rails fairly quickly if that level of trust gets, gets harmed in some way or another. And then the question becomes how do you adapt to that? What, uh, what kind of changes or restitution are you going to make to get the relationship back on track? So for me, trust is, uh, is, uh, is an earned, uh, earned relationship. Uh, working with many, many, many partners, many things can go wrong, but if you've uh, developed that level of trust throughout the organization, not only between you and I, but for the, you know, with the people that we work with, that you work with and I work with, and they're all kind of working from the same page and they've all developed relationships and they, they understand what the mission is, then uh, I think we've got uh, no, no, uh, no lack of opportunity to kind of work together to make that all work. An aspect of that, which I'd like to talk about for a moment, is, is communication. Mm -hmm. um, such a fundamental part of, of your role and responsibility, communicating to others, uh, bringing clarity to a discussion or a topic. And you uh, are, if you don't mind my saying, an exceptionally good communicator. 
It is an incredibly in important skill, though, and something that <clears throat> all of us at any stage in our career have a desire to cultivate, some harder than others to do that. Have you always been a very adept communicator? Did you have to work at communication? How do you approach yeah. that? Totally. So, uh, you know, I mean, you know, uh, I've been at this for a while, so you, you kind of get uh, training and help and assistance and, uh, you know, you learn from your mistakes and uh, I've made a pile and, uh, you know, and every time you make one, uh, you, 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 know, you know what not to do and, and how, how to approach that. I'm, I mean, I'm, uh, I, I, some would argue with the, the, the notion that I'm a good communicator because if, if they don't like what I'm saying, I'm a lousy communicator. Uh, if they like what I'm saying, then, oh, he's brilliant, he's brilliant. You know what, there's, uh, I think I, I, I have the ability to tell people what I know. And I think knowing your subject matter uh, is everything when it comes to communication. So the worst thing you can do is try and talk about something that you don't know anything about. And if you're uh, required to know, you know what this organization's about, you better know what you're talking about. And so, uh, it, I, and I think most people are in that space. If they know their topic, they could talk forever on that. You could probably talk about the law forever and not have a nervous moment or a, or a, or a minute where you would, uh, you, know, you would wonder, what am I going to say? Because you know your topic uh, through and through. And, and I take exactly the same approach. So I, I want to make sure that if I I'm talking about any topic, that I, that I fully know what I'm talking about. And uh, you know, having been around a while, you certainly gain that level of experience. Uh, am I, uh, am I uh, you know, what most people are, which is uh, public speaking, you want to run the other way? I've never been afraid of public speaking. Uh, doesn't mean I've always been comfortable in that role, but I've never been afraid of it. Uh, and I've always kind of welcomed it because I, I see it as a great opportunity to share information with people. And you know, the larger the crowd, in some respects, the better. Um, but uh, know what you're talking about. And the worst thing you can do is uh, come out of it and somebody says, what, 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 what did he say? What did he mean? I didn't get it. So uh, I'm, uh, I'm pretty confident in terms of my topic matter and uh, always happy to talk about it. I suppose the flip side of that, and going back to this question of trust, is being able to admit when you don't know what you're talking about. Sure, of course. And then, <laughs> and then, then you should keep your mouth shut. <laughs> and I do, I do. But you know, I mean, there's, there's uh, people, people uh, you know, have a pretty strong uh, BS meter, if I could say. Uh, you know, most people can figure out when you're, uh, when you're on the level and when you're not. And uh, when you're skating, uh, people can tell pretty quickly that you're, uh, you're not really talking about uh, from, a, from a space of knowledge. And so, don't ever, I mean, my, 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 my rule is don't ever get into a space where you, uh, you are starting to make things up just to fill up, fill up the space. You know, the flip side of, of or the other bucket uh, in a conversation about communication, the other bucket from talking is listening. Mm -hmm. which is also a critical component in, in building trust and understanding and a, and a huge part of what you do in the community and within your team. Can you talk with us a little bit about your perspective on, on the importance of listening and how you do that actively? It's uh, totally critical. So our, you know, our public engagement process would not work if all we did was talk to people about what we're doing. Um, we, we, we need to have a, an engaging process. And today's, in, uh, in today's environment, rightfully so, engagement with either business sector or, or public sector or communities around the, in neighborhoods is really all about what, what is it that, uh, that, that you, uh, you want to learn from the city of Hamilton. Ask us those questions and we'll try and provide some answers, but also help us uh, in the work that we're doing. And so, you know, the, uh, the neighborhood action strategy that we have in the city of Hamilton as a result of the Code Red, and I'm not going to get into deeply about Code Red, but you're aware, <laughs> indicating that there is a life expectancy difference between the lower city and, and uh, you know, some of the more affluent places of some 20 years. Well, the, 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 the realization came to us that we can't march in there and tell these folks that we have all the answers and this is going to solve the problem. Uh, quite the opposite happened is we needed to go in there, sit down with a lot of people and just listen to what their thoughts and ideas about are in terms of how we can empower them to, uh, to change that uh, dynamic, which is that, that different, uh, different life expectancy uh, scenario. And that has worked extremely well, and it really is all about listening to them, giving them the tools they need to, to uh, lift themselves into a different uh, paradigm. Uh, a top-down approach is uh, long gone. Uh, Trickle-down, in my view, is, uh, is history. Uh, it's all about trickle-up. What, 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 what is the community at large looking to get? 
how are we going to help them get there? Is, is that a, a perspective that you'd say that you also at least aspire to cultivate within the organization, within the city staff itself in terms of listening and, and trickling up and, and empowering? And it's uh, frontline services and, you know, that are out there every day uh, have a better understanding of what's, what's needed out on the street. Uh, so if there are the, uh, the, uh, the uh, waste management folks that are, uh, you know, out there working on uh, the water lines and the sewers, uh, you know, they have thoughts and ideas about how it can improve or change or alter. Uh, we need to hear from them as to uh, what their thoughts and ideas are, because from where I sit, I have no clue. I rely on them to, to inform us in terms of how we can make those, kind of those kinds of improvements. And it's, it's really, really the same idea that we employ in the neighborhood strategy approach, we also employ in the organization itself. So empower people, get them together, have conversations about how things could improve uh, locally uh, in, in their department, or if they have ideas about other departments, uh, please share them. And let's tap into all of those great minds that are uh, 8,000 8, minds employed at the city of Hamilton. How do we mind them to, uh, to, to make our, our, our city better? A very significant conversation within the business community um, and within organizations is this question of the importance of culture. Mm. And there's an enormous amount of debate um, you know, in the literature and within those communities about the, the competing tensions and differences between culture and strategy for an organization. And when we talk about culture, you know, we're talking about many of the things that you've already discussed in terms of listening and empowering others. Um, but of course, I think most of us would appreciate that having a very positive culture is critically important to being successful. C do you have a perspective on the importance of culture, a, a perspective on the culture that you uh, feel the city and the city organization possesses? Um, and many, any thoughts on how you as a leader look to build a very positive and empowering culture? Well, I mean, I think that's the key word, is, is the empowering part. Uh, you know, if you, if you fail to do that, then the, the culture is going to be disjointed and, you know, disassociated with where, where, where you're trying to go. So for me, it, it, it stems from, uh, you know, a well thought out, interactive, uh, strategic plan. So, you know, when we talk about strategic plan, what used to happen is that, you know, the top executives would get together or the top management team would get together and say, here's, here's the things that we need to do. And uh, you know how do we make that? How do we make that happen? Uh, quite the opposite happens now, where the strategic planning process actually comes from the bottom up. Uh, not only not only from the organization itself, and, and by by virtue of you know our, our leading a city, it comes from from the city at large. So we have you know the uh, the future Hamilton exercises that really talk about you know what what are the people of Hamilton thinking our future city needs to be, and what elements are they concerned about. How do we bring that into the organization, and then let that uh, let that filter through the, uh, the 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 lower lower levels of the organization, and then on up into up into the uh, the senior management team and leadership team for final decisions. So it's a, it's a completely interactive process. Uh, it's it, it, they're not separate anymore. You know, we used to see the public as separate from the from the organizational structure. It's now a completely integrated atmosphere, and I think. Uh, uh, that's where it needs to be. That's where the public demands it to be. And so we need to keep kind of filtering that through the organization as a whole. We'll change gears a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, you talked about the importance in, in this community and its development uh, of, of partnership with the many institutions that you connect to your constituents. And, and of course, you and your economic uh, development team have embraced the idea of partnership with our firm, <coughs> excuse me, and encouraging our efforts to leverage our global networks to assist and advance the city in cultivating investment and economic activity um, with the view to helping to build this community together. And of course, you and a number of our colleagues are off to India shortly to do that, yeah. which yeah. we're all very much looking forward to. Um, but this, this partnership in, in service of the, the city's interests is, of course, relatively new. And although there have been some early very positive returns from our perspective, you know, creating some education and understanding as to why and how this type of partnership is in the best interests of a private organization like ours is something that we need to continually talk about. Can you share with me your perspective on what might be in it for an institution like ours and working so closely with the city and this community in, in, in helping everybody? Well, I mean, at, at a very, uh, a very crass level, it's work 
for, uh, for, for you, uh, but for us, it's taking advantage of your global reach and your global uh, you know, understanding of markets throughout the world that we need to tap into. So India being you know, a prime example mm -hmm. and um, you know, other locations that were, as municipalities, we're now taking advantage of that kind of level of outreach. We're not waiting for the province or we're not waiting for the federal government to tell us to go to India and look for opportunities. We know and we're, we're developing relationships with municipalities and businesses uh, on our own in partnership with partners that can uh, help smooth that process. And so uh, I, I really, I mean, I'm, I'm being very selfish about this. We're using you to help us outreach throughout the world to help our business environment, uh, you know, expand their opportunities for future employment and future sustainability. Uh, obviously, the, your firm would get the, the benefit of, uh, you know, work that, uh, and, and, a, and a growth and development in your network. And I think, I think, I think the, uh, the, the, I mean, the legal world has changed. I don't have to tell you that. I think there needs to be, I think, for, uh, for you know, major legal firms uh, start thinking about how do they participate in city building as opposed to, well, let's just deal with the, uh, the legal issues that come up as a result of that. Uh, I think there's room for uh, that level of partnership work, collaboration all the way through the process. So city building is no longer an isolated adventure that the city just of steps into. It requires many partners and, uh, and Gowlings and others are, are very much a part of that equation. How do, how do we use those resources that are already in existence to uh, further that along or how do we help, help uh, organizations and firms like yours step into uh, a different paradigm in terms of uh, what, how their legal services are employed in the future? You, you know we've come through um a federal election cycle, we're about to head into a U.S. election cycle, and so much of that, indeed so much of the, the polemics in our society is, is very much a tension and argument between haves and have-nots, between the one percent and the working class. Um, and of course for you, particularly in this community, bridging the divide between those constituencies, making people understand that we're all in it together, that being hostile to business doesn't serve the health and wealth being of the community, mm -hmm. is, it's an enormously challenging task. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk with us a little bit about that, the importance of ensuring that you, know, you have a, a healthy and vibrant business environment, but that you're also being mindful of the importance of bringing the least advantaged in the community along and how they're connected? Sure. Uh, you know, I mean, uh, you know, a job for anyone is, is a life-affirming thing, I mean, a decent job. And so there's many elements to that and, uh, you know, not, not, not paying attention to the kind of the work environment, the, the future employment opportunities for a city like Hamilton that, that could be considered at some level to be a bedroom community of Toronto. Uh, even though that's not our history, but people conceive of it that way in some, some level. Um, we need to pay attention to the future employment opportunities. That, that's really critical, uh, priority number one, because it, it, that kind of uh, economic trickle down matters a lot in terms of what our future sustainability as a city is going to be. I mean, from a, even from a tax perspective, we need good, solid, strong, viable companies to help support our tax base. So commercial industrial tax growth, very important. But what keeps me up at night and, and what municipalities don't have a lot of control around is the employability of uh, the folks that are, are in, for whatever reason, and we talked about this earlier, being left behind as a result of artificial intelligence, uh, efficiencies, you know, different ways of producing things that take less manpower, robotics, I mean you can just add it up, automated vehicles, uh, those, those things are going to change employment in the future dramatically. And if we fail to deal with those that are either going to be unemployed or underemployed in the future, and we already see signs of that happening, then social unrest will ruin our cities, our province, and our country. Uh, and you know, you see elements of that happening in the United States already, maybe even around the world, where there's, uh, you know, a great uh, a mass of people that aren't necessarily covered by the unemployment numbers anymore because they've given up, they're, they're out of it, they're maybe working in precarious employment, working two or three jobs, might have spent uh, you know seven years in university and end up working at Tim Hortons. I'm not saying that's the rule but it's happening more and more today and so if we do not find a way of sharing the you know, kind of the uh, the national resources with those individuals that are uh, under or unemployed 
uh, we are going to have social strife in the future. So failure to deal with that on a national level, even on a provincial level, uh, is going to be critical. That's why we were so keen on that basic income pilot test, which really, w in my mind, would have demonstrated that some upfront investment giving people a decent standard of living, decent, not you're not going to make people wealthy, but you're going to keep them off the margins. Uh, giving them a decent standard of living will save us money in the, uh, the health care system, will save us money in the social justice system. I mean, there's a, there's a real reduced cost if we do some upfront investing. That is an area that keeps me up at night and I worry about uh, n not only locally but nationally. And if we fail to deal with that, uh, I think we're going to have some social problems. Apart from obviously the passive importance of businesses investing to help you along in that regard, is, mm -hmm. is there any advice uh, or any direction or assistance that you can provide us as uh, owners of, of private industry and to, as to how we can help with that project better? Advocacy. I mean, I, I think we need to come around to, uh, you know, everyone coming to understand that there is a, there is a different paramine, paradigm coming our way and how are we going to manage that. So uh, advocacy on, on the corporate side, uh, you know, a greater sense of corporate responsibility. It doesn't necessarily lie on your shoulders, but certainly some of the industries that have uh, basically pushed the kind of the pension and uh, social responsibility onto taxpayers uh, need to get back to uh, a sense of looking after their employees for you know for life as opposed to uh, you know we'll, we'll get rid of all the benefits that they can accrue and we'll try and minimize the pension uh, you know that we're going to offer and, and put the onus all all on the government uh, that's not going to work that's not going to sustain itself so a greater sense of corporate responsibility towards employees and and those that we can employ, I think, is going to be part of the picture. Not the only part. I mean, government will have a role to play. But on the corporate side, there needs to be a greater sense of uh, we, are, we are going to provide the kinds of benefits that will sustain people in a decent quality of life. When I uh, sat to interview Rob McIsaac, the CEO of Hamilton Health Sciences, who, as you know, was also the mayor of Burlington for a time, I asked him about the mediating role of government and private enterprise. You. Uh, that is, the municipal government uh, are, you know, you have many conversations with businesses constantly in which they're asking for something or help with something, whether it's a, a building permit or whether it's assistance in setting up a new business. Um, but in terms of, of those, those conversations, what advice would you give the business community in getting the most out of municipal government in how they approach and talk to municipal government and collaborate with them in a way that is more likely to, to lead to success rather than combating and, 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 and being aggressive. Yeah, and yeah. I, I would say, uh, you know, understand the economic environment we're operating in. So, you know, a lot of, lot of uh, you know, developers come to the table with grandiose schemes that are out of scale or out of scope with what's happening in the community. I mean, I think they need to, you know, cor the, the corporate side needs to intuitively understand uh, where we are as a municipality, uh, what our, our, our strategic needs are and how they can fit into helping uh, you know, that strategic need get uh, developed. So we're, you know, our, our mission is uh, be the best place to raise a child and age successfully. And if you think about that, I mean, that really covers the whole paradigm of one's life. Uh, what we want to have happen in our city is that people have a successful, decent uh, quality of life from, from the beginning of life to the end of life. And so how does the corporate entity, how do, how do our corporate players here participate in that kind of, uh, you know, th that kind of paradigm. Uh, to be a partner in that, whether it's giving back on the, uh, you know, on the corporate side in terms of community or being a stronger, uh, you know, uh, uh, organization that provides benefits, uh, you know, that, that, that maybe don't exist today. Or if it's advocacy towards the provincial and federal governments to get into some, you know, pi basic pilot programs or basic income programs that will help sustain people on the margins. Uh, all of those are going to be important factors, and I think the corporate sector can be a very, very strong player in making all of that happen. Mayor Eisenberger, I want to thank you for your time. We look forward to helping you with all of those things. Me too. All right. Thank you. Great chat. Thanks for listening to the Accelerating Business Podcast, powered by Galling WLG. If you'd like to be a guest or for more information, please visit gallingwlg.com Accelerate Podcast.